Sclerotinia diseases of common vegetable crops. Sclerotinia diseases such as timber rot and lettuce drop are caused by the soil-borne fungus Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. This fungus has a very wide host range, including legumes, solanaceous plants, etc. Again, this is a soil-borne pathogen, meaning that it lives most of its life in the soil, and even when it emerges from the soil, it remains near the soil surface. We see sclerotinia diseases when we have very intense cropping, especially when there's not a rotation out of susceptible hosts. For example, uh, a rotation of tomato to lettuce would not rotate out of a non-host plant. Sclerotinia typically prefer very cool soil conditions. Here in Kentucky, we see sclerotinia diseases in uh, springtime, usually April or May, and by mid-May, as uh, for instance, high tunnel soil start to warm up, we don't see as much sclerotinia. Less common is the species sclerotinia minor. We don't see it as much as we see sclerotinia sclerotiorum. Typical symptoms of sclerotinia diseases include stem rots, um, and as a result of those stem rots, we'll see wilt and dieback, particularly of, for instance, tomato. Uh, usually the lesions or the spots that uh, emerge will start with water soaking. Um, if you see at the very top of the lesion in this photo, you'll see kind of that wet, almost greasy looking spot. That would be the initial symptoms, and uh, that would be followed by um, by rotting and decay, uh, softening of the stem. In lettuce, we'll see um, head and crown rots there at the base of the, um, of the plant. The signs of the scler sclerotinia disease or the signs of the pathogen will be that white fluffy mycelia that we saw in the previous photo. Um, that would be very common. That is the body or the thread-like body of the fungus itself. Um, most importantly, the sclerotia, these are these irregularly shaped um, structures, and those are the black, um, the black structures in the center of this lettuce in this image. And the sclerotia are this long-term um, survival structure or overwintering structure. And these are the long-term survival. This is the part of the life cycle that we absolutely don't want to allow to occur, occur in our fields or high tunnels. In this photo, we'll see, this is timber rot of tomato. Inside of the stem, you'll see some of the uh, decay of the stem, but those sclerotia developing inside that stem. So overall, the life cycle of sclerotinia begins with the introduction of the fungus into the field or into the high tunnel. Usually sclerotinia comes in um, mixed in with soil particles or in infected transplants. Uh, sometimes even if we have uh, seeds um, or bags of seed that are not cleaned well, if there's debris that sort of hitchhikes in with a bag of seed, um, that's usually that initial introduction into a field or high tunnel. From there, the fungus will spread by uh, any type of means that these sclerotia can move around. So uh, any way that we move soil, uh, such as our uh, tractor implements or muddy shoes or any kind of tools, um, anytime water carries soil particles from one area to the next, um, as I said earlier, infected plants, or any way that we could have debris that is going to move this, um, these fungal structures from one place to another. The sclerotia are, again, these irregularly shaped survival structures, and they're very hard and they'll dry out and they're very long lived. Um, in fact, they can survive in soil five to seven years without a host. So very important, once sclerotinia establishes in a field or in a high tunnel, it is very hard to get rid of uh, simply because of this long-term survival. Overall, uh, the sclerotinia will germinate. Um, some species, uh, in particular the sclerotinia minor, usually mycelia or that white fluffy uh, body will germinate directly out of the sclerotia. But more commonly, especially with the sclerotinia sclerotiorum, uh, apothecia will form. And these are um, mushroom type structures that will emerge from sclerotia and actually forcibly discharge spores 
um, up into the canopy. And sometimes they can go extremely high. Other times they'll stay pretty localized right near the soil surface. But because here in Kentucky we see more Sclerotinia sclerotiorum, we'll see usually that, that um, discharge into the lower canopy of a lot of plants. Optimal conditions for this uh, sclerotial germination um, will begin when temperatures reach about 55 or 60 degrees. In fact, 60 degrees is optimal for these sclerotia to begin to germinate. So within the first 24 hours of reaching ideal temperatures and ideal water, uh, ideal moisture, those sclerotia will start to imbibe water. So they'll start to condition and get ready to germinate. And usually within four to eight weeks, that's when that sclerotia will actually germinate and the spores will be released from those sclerotia and infection can occur. Uh, for those spores that are ejected into the canopy, uh, there's going to have to be moisture within that canopy. So there will have to be a high relative humidity or leaf wetness at the very least. Um, and usually that is a humidity above 70 percent or again, leaf wetness such as rain or overhead irrigation. Overall, sclerotinia are opportunistic pathogens, so they're not highly pathogenic. They just um, wait on the opportunity um, to infect, and usually that's a result of weak plants or any kind of wounded plant tissue so, uh, where it can easily infect. So it's not an aggressive pathogen, but we all know that, um, especially when we're doing any pruning or pinching or um, anything that would wound plants, we create an opportunity for this fungus to actually enter plant tissue. We do know that any, any amount of excess water, any kind of flooding, a water holding capacity of above 80% or, or absolute saturation or flooding will suppress or even start to decompose um, sclerotia and start to weaken the sclerotinia. Also at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, any actively growing sclerotinia will start to die back or um, if sclerotia are dry and dormant, they will remain dormant at and above about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Sclerotinia diseases are typically more pronounced or um, more aggressive during certain conditions, during certain field conditions. That includes um, anytime tissue is damaged or wounded, like I uh, mentioned earlier. When soil temperatures are cool, again, 60 degrees is that optimal temperature. Um, anytime there's sustained soil moisture, so when we have wet or very damp soil conditions, which usually occur in springtime and coincides uh, with that 60 degree optimal temperature. Also, especially in high tunnels, this applies when canopy humidity is very high. So anytime there's reduced uh, canopy circulation or air circulation within a canopy, that can be very dense plantings when there are weeds, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, spacing plants is a, another consideration. Anything we can do to dry out that canopy will reduce those conditions that are conducive for um, infection and disease. So taking all of that information into consideration, we can think about how we can use uh, that life cycle data to prevent infection in the first place. So the first thing we must, uh, we must avoid any introduction of sclerotinia into our fields or into our high tunnels, bringing in clean seed and assuring our transplants are not infected from the very beginning. If we do have sclerotinia in any of our fields or high tunnels, we have to be very aware of it and reduce any spread or limit that spread as much as possible. So as we move our equipment or tools uh, from one area to the next, be, um, be really conscious of washing that equipment, cleaning your shoes, cleaning any of your tools uh, before moving from one field to the next. As a matter of fact, starting in clean fields in the beginning of the day and then working in contaminated fields at the end of the day is an ideal practice. Whatever you do, really focus on not moving any soil particles from one, from one area to the next. Um, anytime you see infected plant material, to get it out, so to rogue those plants and destroy those plants right away. Don't just throw them in the centers of the aisles or near the field. Actually get them out, out of that field or that high tunnel altogether. So the 
the key here is to not allow additional sclerotinia um, there on site and to actually not allow that pathogen to build up in numbers. So you're destroying any debris. And at the end of the season, making sure that all plant material comes out of the field and is not left in the field. I mentioned most of this earlier, but suppressive conditions, anytime that soil starts getting hot above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that suppresses uh, sclerotinia. Dry conditions, low canopy humidity, and of course, vigorous plants that are not wounded are all suppressive in terms of reducing uh, disease altogether. So anytime we can uh, utilize any of these practices, it will really benefit our crops. So more on management of sclerotinia diseases. Um, well, first, we're going to make sure that we're tilling at least two inches deep. We've got to bury these sclerotia if there are sclerotia in the soil. So they need to, sclerotia need to be within the top two inches of soil in order for them to germinate in um, under those ideal conditions. So if we can deep till and bury them, we're keeping them from germinating. And if they do imbibe water and are not able to germinate, they'll start decomposing. We can utilize resistant cultivars in some crops. Lettuce and beans, for example, um, have resistant cultivars available. So make sure you check your seed source. And if you do have sclerotinia in, on your site, um, utilizing some of these resistant cultivars is ideal. Otherwise, it's really critical to rotate to a non-host, so something that sclerotinia will not, will not affect. Um, three year minimum is my recommendation, but if we could go up to five years rotating out of a susceptible host, that will really help reduce the, the number of sclerotinia um, propagules that are in the soil in the field or high tunnel. And this is a long stretch, but anytime we can alter our planting time to keep a crop out of the field during those ideal conditions. So a cool season crop, anything we could plant earlier so that it's out of the field by the time sclerotinia becomes active, or if we can use a warm season crop and plant later. So uh, cool season crops earlier in the season and warm season crops later in the season to avoid that April, May window. So that's a consideration and it may work for some growers, not all. And of course, moisture is needed for the sclerotinia pathogen to um, survive and to multiply. So reducing soil moisture as much as possible um, and reducing humidity in the canopy as much as possible will help slow the spread and slow the, um, the acceleration of disease. So I usually don't talk directly about fungicides. We have a lot of spray guides that um, provide fungicide recommendations for a lot of our diseases. But in terms of greenhouses and high tunnels, we have a limited amount of uh, fungicides that can be used in greenhouses and are also um, uh, effective against sclerotinia. So um, I have a few listed here. Um, Contans is the only one that is OMRI certified here. But do remember that fungicides are only serving as preventative um, suppressive at best that fungicides never cure disease so if you know you have sclerotinia on a site to plant a susceptible host and depend on fungicides is not a is not going to um, provide the best yield for you um, so using the cultural practices with, that we've already discussed but if uh, sclerotinia does pop up to use fungicides as suppressants um, if you absolutely must plant into an infected area to use fungicides as preventative. So to make sure that as our ideal temperatures and our ideal soil moisture starts creeping up on us around April to start using fungicides as preventatives to protect your plants before they become infected. So in summary, we're at all times going to try to avoid introducing sclerotinia into our fields and high tunnels. And if sclerotinia is introduced, we're going to reduce spread. We're going to keep it from moving from one site in our field to the next. Understanding the life cycle of sclerotinia is really important because we can use information like temperature, moisture, and host range to be able to avoid the most critical periods for this fungus. 
Anytime we can, we're going to use resistant cultivars, especially in terms of lettuce and beans, where resistant cultivars are available. Otherwise, we must rotate out of susceptible hosts for at least three years. Uh, three to five years is a really good window, especially when you have very high populations of sclerotinia. Limiting wounding, and that includes pinching and trimming and training plants. Um, those those uh, practices will uh, produce wounds and wounds, of course, is how the fungus gets into the plant tissue. Anytime we see disease material, we're going to remove it immediately and not give the, the fungus an opportunity to produce more sclerotia and build up even more in our soils. Cultural practices are critical in all circumstances. So everything I've said above is really important, whether you are a non-spray, organic or conventional grower, you're still going to have to use cultural practices to manage sclerotinia diseases. Um, if you are going to use fungicides at all, remember that they're not curative. We have to use them as preventatives, at very best as suppressants. So um, in closing, I want to remind everyone to utilize our um, Department of Plant Pathology website where we have um, lots of publications, um, those that describe the life cycles of, of sclerotinia and other pathogens, as well as spray guides and cultural guides. They're all here on our website. So again, uh, check those out, use them for reference and um, make it a habit to really understand life cycles of these pathogens for better management. And of course, always contact your local extension office for any up-to-date recommendations. Uh, your county agent will always know what's best for, um, for our area and uh, anything new, uh, specialists always communicate those to them. So um, again, visit our website, plantpathology.ca.uky.edu, where you'll find lots of resources. And also follow us on social media, KY Plant Disease. Thank you.